it's not really possible to properly teach the fascinating, the important book of Hosea without establishing a historical and a theological background as context. That is, what we shall begin with today in our introduction to the book of Hosea is exactly that, context. Now, if you haven't studied Torah with me or with someone else, beginning with Genesis, you will be at a decided disadvantage to those who have. Because no matter which Bible books you might study, not beginning at the beginning of the Bible leaves you unprepared. Each book assumes you already have certain knowledge of what came earlier. There is no remedial training in the Scriptures. Hosea is no different, especially because Israel's historical and religious and, and political situation at the time he wrote it is nearly as important to grasp as is Israel's problematic relationship with God that had developed by then. Now, I will indeed offer you some of the historical information to build the context of Hosea's writings, but it will be relatively brief, it will be necessarily incomplete. So if you have the time and interest and you've not studied the Torah, you may want to stop now and go do so and come back in the future to the study of Hosea. However, if you prefer to continue without that foundation, welcome. The best place to start is probably by defining what Hosea was. He was known as a prophet of Jehovah, the God of Israel. Although nowhere in the book named for him does he or anyone else make that claim. In fact, his name is only mentioned twice in the entire book. Rather, he is called prophet because he ticks off the boxes necessary for his peers and, and for those who, who followed him to rightfully declare him a prophet of God. What's a prophet? Now that may sound rather basic, kind of simplistic for those who have spent a little time at least in church or synagogue, but I assure you it's not. What a prophet was, what a prophet did, evolved over the centuries. From a purely theological viewpoint, the term prophet speaks of someone who has a special connection with the divine that's well beyond the ordinary. Most of the known pagan religions had prophets, so the office wasn't limited to the Hebrew faith. Sometimes that divine connection seems as basic as but a good relationship between a human and their god or their gods. Biblically, it often comes at times when that kind of a relationship is in short supply. Now, sometimes it can be that the prophet used as, is used as that divinity's earthly mouthpiece in order to deliver a message or as one who, who carries out certain actions on that divinity's behalf. At other times, a prophet is a, a teller of the future, a seer. The first person called prophet in the Bible was Abraham. Let's see in what way Abraham was a prophet. In Genesis 20, starting in verse 1, we read this, Avraham traveled from there towards the Negev, and he lived between Kadesh and Shur. And while living in his, an alien in Gerar, Avraham was saying of his Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. So Avimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah, but God came to 
Avimelech in a dream one night, and he said to him, you are about to die because of the woman you have taken since she is someone's wife. Now, Avimelech had not come near to her, so he said, Lord, will you kill even an upright nation? Didn't he himself say to me, she's my sister? And even she herself said, he's my brother. In doing this, my heart's been pure, my hand's innocent. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that in doing this, your heart has been pure, and I too have kept you from sinning against me. This is why I didn't let you touch her. Therefore, return the man's wife to him now, because he is a prophet. And he will pray for you, so that you will live. But if you don't return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who belong to you. So here the term prophet indicates Abraham's close, personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship with his God. And therefore, whatever Abraham is doing, he and his family will be divinely protected and directed by his God. Now, if we were to read a little more about Abraham, we'd find that he has audible, two-way conversation with God. And that God instructs Abraham to do certain things, and Abraham even debates with him a little bit. Well, next, chronologically speaking, we read of Aaron. Moses' brother being described as a prophet. In Exodus starting in, uh, 7, starting in verse 1, But Adonai said to Moshe, I have put you in the place of God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother will be your prophet. You are to say everything I order you, and Aaron your brother is to speak it to Pharaoh and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his land. So, at this point, now that we're talking about maybe 500 years after Abraham, Aaron is described as Moses' prophet, not God's really, except by an indirect means. Moses has the close divine connection, not Aaron. In this particular case, Moses tells Aaron what to say to the Pharaoh. Moses is as mediator, has his own prophet, his brother. And this is well before the time Aaron became a high priest. What does this prophet do? Oh, well, he just simply passes along what Moses, God's mediator, tells him to pass along. So, Aaron as a prophet is quite different from Abraham as a prophet. Now, skipping forward, again, chronologically. We read in Deuteronomy a general instruction from God through Moses about prophets. The broad implication is that prophets of all kinds and varieties are going to arise, and they're going to begin to play an increasing role in the lives of God's people, Israel. Deuteronomy 13, verses 2 through 4. If a prophet or someone who gets a message while dreaming arises among you and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and then the sign or the wonder comes about as he predicted when he said, let's follow other gods which you've not known. Let us serve them. You're not to listen to what that prophet or dreamer says, for Adonai your God is testing you in order to find out whether you really do love Adonai your God with all your heart and your being. Now, as Bible history unfolds, we are led to the person who would transition Israel from the time of the Judges, which was just shortly after Israel's arrival to Canaan, to the time of the Kings a few hundred years later. Samuel is introduced. Raised by a priest, at times operating like one, we read this about Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, 20-21. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, became aware that Shmuel, Samuel, had been confirmed as a prophet of Adonai. 
Adonai continued appearing in Shiloh, Shiloh, for Adonai revealed himself to Shmuel in Shiloh by the word of Adonai. See, Samuel's role is a strange hybrid of priest and prophet. Not quite a mediator like Moses, but of a much higher recognized status than this strange new group of men that had sprung up called the Nevaim. Now, Nevaim, which in biblical Hebrew is usually translated as prophets, were men whose role in Israelite society are hard to pin down. They weren't prophets like Samuel or Moses or Aaron or even Abraham. There's no actual mention of direct communication between them and God, nor are they like Hosea or Isaiah or Jeremiah, or a lot of the more familiar prophets that would come later. The Nevi'im tended to operate in groups, and their main calling card was to go into trances or to speak ecstatically, that is, speaking in very mystical ways while in a high state of emotion. They were considered, the Nevi'im, the holy men of that time. They lived in communes, and they were respected by the people. What religious authority they carried isn't clear. How someone was selected and accepted into the community of the Nevi'im, that's not clear either. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 5-8. through 8. After that, you will come to Giva of God, where the Pelishtim, the Philistines, are garrisoned. On our arrival at the city there, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place, preceded by lutes and tambourines, flutes and lyres, and they will be prophesying. Then the spirit of Adonai will fall on you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And when these signs come over you, just do whatever you feel like doing because God's with you. Then you are to go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and there I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and present sacrifices as peace offerings. Wait there seven days until I come to you and tell you what to do. See, whatever the purpose and the function of these groups of prophets were, clearly at least some of them were doing the will of God, and they had some type of a relationship with him. And by the time of David, these Nevi'im seemed to play an increasing role in, in worship and in spiritual discernment and in bringing the word of truth to Israel's leadership. In fact, at this point, we find prophets like Nathan being assigned to specific Israelite kings to bring them God's instructions. Well, after the reigns of Kings David and Solomon, and then this immediate civil war that followed Solomon's death, Israel was split apart into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom was called Israel, although it was actually more often known as Ephraim, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. The northern kingdom consisted of ten of the twelve Israelite tribes, with the southern kingdom representing the remaining two. It's at this time, during the reigns of King Ahab and Ahaziah, that the very strange and enigmatic Elijah appeared. Elijah was also called a prophet. Now, Elijah was quite different from any preceding person called a prophet. He was not assigned to be a source of godly wisdom to an Israelite king. He wasn't at all like the mystical men of the Nevi'im. He didn't perform priest-like duties, nor did he fade away into trances. Rather, Elijah's job was to forcefully and bluntly tell Israel that God was very unhappy with them because they had forsaken 
forsaken him, and they were worshiping Canaanite gods, particularly Baal. And that as such, Israel was on a collision course with Yahweh that was going to result in a catastrophe. Well, next we come to a group of prophets that most Bible students are, are familiar with. Men like Jonah, Amos, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and of course, Hosea. Now, these are called by scholars the writing prophets. The writing prophets. In other words, these men wrote down their prophetic words for posterity. The writing prophets have Bible books named after them. The writing prophets are further divided into the minor prophets and the major prophets. What's the difference? Only in the length of their writings. Their importance, their religious status, or their significance, that plays no role whether you're they're a minor or a major prophet. The shorter books are called minor, the longer books called major. So our Hosea is, on that basis, classified as a minor prophet. Now, although prophets that came later after Hosea also had different roles than their predecessors, we're not going to go any further because it's just not pertinent to our study. The important point is, that a prophet is a very broad term. Prophet's a very broad term. It just can't easily be shoved into a common mold or, or definition. Hosea, actually, I think, was most similar to Elijah. And probably could have even been called Elijah's successor. Because he was tasked by God with bringing a message to Israel they didn't want to hear. A strong message of chastisement, followed by guaranteed impending doom. It was a doom brought about from their unfaithfulness to, Yeho to, the, uh, to Yehovah. A doom, <laughs> it was a doom that was already in motion, from which they could do nothing to prevent it. In God's judgment of them, they'd already passed the point of no return. All they could do now, once they heard Hosea's message, was to accept it. Can you imagine? That's all they could do. Accept it. They could prepare for it, and they could understand why it was going to happen to them. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes to pause and hope to impress upon you something that I think is critical for our day and time. And I believe you'll agree with me that it is important. But before I do that, in order to conclude the general subject of prophets, I want to say that although in no way do I classify myself as a prophet, in some ways, especially as we see the term applied in the New Testament, I am. See, this is because by New Testament times, the term prophet and prophesy and prophecy had continued to evolve until a prophet came to mean a person of faith in the God of Israel who studied, interpreted, and spoke about the Holy Scriptures. So today, while almost any Bible teacher could legitimately be thought of as a prophet in that narrow New Testament sense, because that term is much too often misused, misunderstood, misappropriated, it's my opinion that a pastor, a rabbi, a Bible teacher is best to steer clear of anointing oneself with such a title. And further, he or she shouldn't allow others to call them a prophet. For hundreds of years, 
Christians due to a misunderstanding of the New Testament and with little knowledge of the Old have a belief, or at least have a feeling, that God is going to somehow always strive with us personally as individuals, or maybe on a larger scale, with mankind in general, and avoid pouring out His wrath on us. See, this line of thinking is primarily due to the doctrine that God is love. And therefore, how could a loving God ever intentionally cause harm to humans which he created? And especially to those individuals who claim to worship him. Further, that whatever outpouring of God's disfavor and wrath might theoretically ever come, it will always be well into some hazy future. Maybe happen to some other people, some other nation than ours, because we're good enough that it ought not to happen to us. At least we're good when, we're, when you compare it with others. On an almost instinctive belief, it is that Sufficient repentance, or even just being especially compassionate, can always deter God's anger and the consequences of our past sins. The Bible tells us that God deals with humanity in two distinct, two distinct but completely interrelated spheres. First, He weighs out our individual lives. And second, he judges according to whatever group, whatever corporate associations we might have, with the entire group receiving a common judgment. The most common group association that the Bible deals with is one's tribe or kingdom or, or nation. Now, another mistaken belief that in no way is backed up biblically is that with the advent of Christ, the way God deals with disobedience and faithless humanity has changed. That His severity has changed to mercy. That is, since the divine Messiah Yeshua is considered as the epitome of love and mercy, that how God dealt with Israel in the Old Testament era, harshly, has no bearing on how God will deal with us in the present age or the future. See, if we'll open our minds and our hearts to God, what we're going to learn in Hosea is that we are today living in an era that is nearly identical to the condition of Israel in Hosea's era. Nearly identical. God's wrath is near, and it is inevitable. Exactly how near, none of us know. And on a corporate level, His wrath is not going to be satisfied by a community of any size or any nature simply because they're nicer people. That is, while our individual repentance, along with trust in Jesus, is most certainly welcomed by God and indeed turns away His anger from us on Judgment Day, humanity as a group is already judged as faithless and idolatrous. It's already judged, doomed just as was the twelve tribes of the northern kingdom. Humanity's improvement from an earthly perspective has cyclically kind of inched up and slid back down and over all the ages, but overall the trajectory always seems to be downward. As a race, we have not become less violent, less greedy, 
more moral. God's judgment is not based on human standards. It's not based on how we judge ourselves. But rather, it's by His standards. And those standards don't ever change. His judgment for our entire planet is already written in stone because of humanity's persistent failings. There is no holding off His wrath. And the time of it has already been determined in heaven. No amount of our pleading, no amount of some newfound goodness of a relative few is going to ward it off, even if that few amounts to a few millions. See, what we learn from Hosea is that even what was thought to be the community of the Hebrew faithful, a community of ten Israelite tribes that insisted it worshipped Jehovah and that they lived their lives righteously had thoroughly deceived themselves. And they were instead living a wicked lie. They had drifted so far from God's laws and commandments and instead had taken up the worthless man-made doctrines of their leaders. Such that they were living the lives of immorality, of faithlessness, all the while steadfastly believing they were in God's good stead. In fact, it's not as though the ten tribes Hosea is speaking to even thought about it very much. No one told one another, you know what? Maybe we need to examine what we believe and see if it's in accordance with the Torah and the law of Moses. Rather, they told one another how good they knew they were, how pleasing their worship was to God. See, the vast spectrum of the Judeo-Christian faith today as religious institutions, not necessarily as individual houses of worship, is equally self-deceived in many ways. Now, I'm speaking in general, of course, always acknowledging there are pockets of God worshipers everywhere who do diligently seek Him and strive to be obedient as biblically prescribed as opposed to doctrinally prescribed. The two main branches of these ancient religious institutions today operate primarily on man-made doctrines, not necessarily even realizing it. The, the nearly universal action of a Gentile-led Christianity so long ago, severing itself from the Torah, would inevitably lead to this faith calamity. Because the standard for godliness was set aside and became no longer known. That one event of stripping the Torah from our faith which was formalized, by the way, in the 4th century, left believers rudderless. With each person, each denomination, determining to do what was right in their own eyes, while always, of course, thinking it good. Likewise, the nearly universal action of Judaism, being well before the birth of Christ, beginning well before the birth of Christ, in creating untold volumes of man-made religious rules that very often collide with or even usurp God's plain commands in the Scriptures have resulted in this same problematic muddle as Christianity finds itself today. Neither religious institution really serves Jehovah as he demands, even though both insist that they do. Instead, both serve themselves, 
having become disobedient and idolatrous. Why idolatrous? I choose that term because we're going to find that idolatry is the primary offense of Israel against God in the book of Hosea. And it results in God's wrath of exiling them from the land by means of invasion from Assyria. In modern times, God worshipers think of idolatry only as worshiping like wooden or stone figurines, you know, of, of various gods. But to God, it means something far broader. Today, in the name of Jesus, Many serve the gods of humanism and populism, all the while pleading that we don't. We do that due to a self-induced blindness to the Holy Scriptures. And because the church and synagogue have been all too happy to accommodate our trendy personal wants and desires and dreams and pleasures by concocting doctrines that seem to make our behavior acceptable to God. From our diet to our observance of holy days to the definition of marriage to gender issues. Much of the church and synagogue have decided to set aside biblical ordinances and instead have adopted the least, the latest fashionable demands of our ever-evolving national cultures in order to keep the seats and the treasuries of our houses of worship sufficiently filled with and by happy people. We are going to learn quickly in the book of Hosea that this is precisely what the ten tribes that formed the northern king, kingdom of Israel had done and as a result, their fate was sealed without them having an inkling of it. Now, another thing we're going to see in our Hosea study is that when a prophet of Jehovah attempts to tell his Israelite brothers such things, the prophet's despised for it. His warnings fall mostly among uh, upon deaf ears, upon hardened hearts. People of all ears like what they like. People of all walks of life sin. You know why? Because we like to sin. People nearly universally do not want to true change in ourselves. We just want our circumstances to improve. People generally get angry when we're told we're wrong. And especially religious people do not want to be told that much of what we might believe and practice isn't of God, it's of men. My prayer as we go forward in this study is for God's Word through Hosea to fall upon listening ears, upon softened hearts, and that we make the message personal. We make it contemporary, not merely an intellectual recollection of a stark warning meant for an ancient people in a long ago time, even though it is certainly that as well. See, there is one outstanding difference, really terrifying difference, really, between Hosea's message to Israel and what God was about to bring upon them versus what God is soon going to bring upon us as part of the entire global community of men. I want you to hear this, please. God's intention for Israel was to purify them from the fatal germ of Baal worship, a germ that had so deeply infected them that it destroyed their relationship with God. 
He was going to do this by punishing them severely for breaking his covenant and removing them to far off places from the now ruined land of promise that he had, had given to them centuries earlier. But, but, he also reassured Israel that after a long time, he would redeem them. He would draw them back to a regenerated land. This drama reveals God battling for the very soul of Israel. On the other hand, God's intention for global humanity in the near future is to purify the earth from those human beings who are infected with the fatal germ of humanism and idolatry. It will be very much like the Great Flood. Most of mankind was not in Noah's time and will not in the near future be saved from the purification of God's wrath. The Lord will not punish humanity and push them away for a while in order to draw them back later as he did with the ten tribes. Oh no. Rather than redeem and return, God's going to destroy. The only exceptions to this coming destruction will be that remnant of mankind which through sincere repentance and an acceptance of the leadership and the lordship of our Messiah, Yeshua, are redeemed on a spiritual level. And this will be done individual by individual. Although many of these redeemed exceptions may still die a physical death as collateral damage during the time of divine planet-wide purification, God's wrath. Nonetheless, these relative few, these repentant faithful, will live on eternally in the closest possible relationship with God. That last part, folks, is the only hope there is. This is the hope that we're all to strive for, to cling to, as the end times calamity draws nearer, and when we finally allow the reality of its certainty and of its horror to penetrate our dulled sentence, uh, senses. I mean, I suspect that of the many people listening to this lesson right now, this may not be what you'd hoped to hear. See, this isn't particularly uplifting and joyful, is it? Well, it's not intended to be. It was intended to be sobering, but to be the truth. This is the tone of Hosea's message. So this is the tone I mean to impart to us all of the 21st century. So let's talk now about the era and the circumstances that Hosea lived in that led to this message of doom. Well, the era and the circumstances in which we and every generation live are enormous influencers of how we think, how our worldviews are shaped, how we live our lives. In our busy lives, we probably don't contemplate it very often because our current reality is what it is. Even if we might wish it was something else, we only infrequently pause long enough to think about how we got here from there in our lives as individuals, let alone reflecting on the far larger picture about the long journey that our nation or global society has taken to get where we are at this moment in history. 
nor when it comes to our faith, do we usually ask ourselves the all-important question, why do we believe what we believe? But Hosea is acutely aware of how historically, how religiously, Israel's current circumstances came to arrive at such a sorry state. And he explains it. Hosea lived and prophesied during the 8th century BC. Israel, meaning the, the ten tribes forming the northern kingdom, was extremely prophesied prosperous. It was generally at peace with all of its neighbors. This peace was enabled by the kings of Israel and in, in, in the few decades prior to, or to rather, and then during Hosea's lifetime, they did this by making treaties with their Gentile neighbors. They also encouraged intermarriage for the sake of a happy coexistence and adopting their neighbor's gods, along with their many worship practices, because it was a very attractive religion that these pagans practiced. The Israelites were perfectly happy to accept and assimilate all these things into their Hebrew culture because of the peace and because of the prosperity that derived from these policies. Yehovah remained Israel's <clears throat> national God, but the Israelites bowed down to other gods as well. These other gods seemed to be of practical use for them. One god was for rain, another god was for victory in battle, another one was for fertility, and so on and so forth. Jeroboam II was the king of Israel when Hosea first prophesied. That would have been in the range of 793 to 753 B.C. Now, it's critical that when reading Hosea, or really anything in the Old Testament after the time of Solomon, that we grasp that Israel had ceased to be a single united nation under one king. In fact, Israel as a single unified nation only ever existed under kings David and Solomon, and for the very short time span of about 70 years. By Hosea's day, Israel had been existing for more than 150 years as two separate nations, two separate kingdoms in reality, under two separate governments with two separate kings. In biblical terms, you know, 150 years doesn't seem all that long to us. But to get a better sense for just how long 150 years is, that's about how long it's been from the time of the American Civil War until today. And who can relate to much of anything about that Civil War? We only know a little and what we might know about that war and era comes from reading a history book. So by Hosea's day, all that any living Israelite had experienced was that some of their tribes made up one kingdom and some of the other tribes made up another kingdom. It was normal. That's how it was. The southern kingdom of Judah and, and uh, the northern kingdom of Israel didn't have particularly good relations with one another. Skirmishes broke out occasionally, more serious confrontations from time to time. Judah tended to remain a little more isolated in their dealings with their Gentile neighbors, while Israel up in the north readily embraced their local neighbors' ways, and even more important, they sought to appease Assyria. Now another crucial bit of knowledge as we prepare to study Hosea, is that Israel, now we're talking the northern kingdom of the ten tribes, more often than not 
went by the name of Ephraim. This was because of the ten tribes of the north, Ephraim was by far the most dominant one. So Hosea was going to switch back and forth between calling it Israel and calling it Ephraim. So we need to be aware of it. It's no different than our switching back and forth, even in one conversation, between the terms America and the United States. And while they might mean technically something different, in common usage, they're just two ways of expressing the same thing. Now, Hosea lived in the northern kingdom. Where exactly, we don't know. And due to its peace and prosperity, Israel was a, a satisfied, a complacent population. However, when their king, Jeroboam II, died in 753 B.C., it ended Israel's longest-serving dynasty that had begun with King Jehu nearly a hundred years earlier. Now, when a dynasty ends, you see, it leaves a power vacuum that somebody's going to fill, usually through violence. And the first to fill it was Zechariah, not the prophet Zechariah. And he became the new king of the northern kingdom, but was never able to implement his own family, own family as a dynasty. Instead of his sons and his grandsons eventually ascending to the throne in succession, as it was with Jehu's dynasty, Zechariah was assassinated within only a few months after taking office. No fewer than six Israelite kings ruled over Israel during the next 30 years, each one being murdered by the one to follow him. This produced chaos, instability, and then along with it, Israel's economy sank. So Israel went from prosperity to desperation within a single generation. Hosea prophesied during the last few years of King Jeroboam II's reign and then throughout this period of rapid deterioration of Israel. And we can see this progression actually reflected in his words. So. One thing we must take from this is that Hosea wrote over a long period of time, decades. No doubt he wrote narratives about whatever the current situation was, then time would pass, he'd write some more, but in light of the changed situation. This would repeat a few times. Now the result is that we see a number of what language scholars call styles of writing reflecting in his prophetic book. Now these style changes have caused some consternation and disagreement within the, the Bible academic community. Some conclude that each different style reflects a change to a different author. Others say Different editors over the years redacted what was originally written, and this accounts for all the different styles. Yet some Bible commentators, like Douglas Stewart and, and James Luther Mays, they take a little more balanced view that naturally Hosea's writings over the course of perhaps 35 years would look and sound a little different as they went along, often with many years passing between Segments. I mean, I can agree with that. I can look back only 20 years to my own writings and compare them to my most recent and notice a definite difference in style. But more, it's unthinkable that there had not been some level of redaction over the centuries because all the ancient biblical writings were hand copied. And it's clear that as history progressed, language terms and their meanings changed, even place names changed, and so an editor might take the liberty to change some of the original words to reflect that, and this process likely happened more than once. Now the good news is, 
we do have some manuscripts, some fragments anyway, from the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls to make some comparisons. The bad news is that these fragments are not from the book of Hosea itself, but rather from a commentary that was made on the book, probably by some Essen writer, well before the time of Christ. In Hebrew, such a, word is, such a work is called a pesher. It's not so much that this pesher that they found gives us information of exactly how the book of Hosea existed on those days, but rather simply that it did exist at that time. It was already well circulated, and it was considered as authoritative Holy Scripture. Now, since intellectual honesty and frankness about what the Bible tells us has always been the fundamental principle of Seed of Abraham Torah class, and that's wherever it might lead us, then it is important to discuss another controversial aspect about the book of Hosea. It is this. Many fine Bible scholars claim that Hosea was written before the book of Deuteronomy, and perhaps even before the law of Moses was established as we find it in Exodus. Leviticus, Numbers. In fact, this view extends to a contention that the book of Hosea very likely affected the creation of the Torah and the books of the law. Now, this notion is also generally applied to all of the Old Testament prophets, including Amos, who wrote about Judah's situation around the same time as Hosea was writing about Ephraim, Israel. Now, of course, such an understanding completely obliterates any notion of the history and evolution of Israel as we find it in the Scriptures as being accurate or true. So to be clear, the notion is that the legal principles, the morals, the fundamental idea of a covenant relationship, the covenant of Moses, being established between Israel and Jehovah did not, in their view, come centuries before Hosea's era. Rather, it is that the mere thought of these legal principles, these societal morals, and of a special covenant relationship was actually all an original thought of Hosea. And then only later was that thought adopted and expanded upon by the Israelites, eventually winding up as a complete, complete written legal code called the Law of Moses. Well, the evidence simply does not validate this worldview. Rather, this belief comes from a couple of notions that became quite popular among theologians as early as the late 19th century. Those notions are that the Bible is mostly religious fiction and myth described as actual history. And even though these scholars are arguing from a position of two to four thousand years after the fact, some modern academics believe that due to their unquestionably high intellect and advanced education, they may just understand more of what these ancient biblical writers believed and meant by what they said, more of what was actually happening to them and around them during those times and they have a better grasp of the language nuances than the people who wrote it and lived at that time. You know, when a person believes that way, then evidence for them amounts to others of their respected profession agreeing with them. Yet the only hard evidence that exists is that the Old Testament prophets, and as concerns us presently, the prophet Hosea, 
who wrote their prophecies within the precepts of the already long-standing background of the covenant of Moses, not the other way around. See, this matters. Because as we're going to see, Hosea bases his prophecies on the principle that Jehovah Yeho- and Israel had an existing covenant agreement, the covenant of Moses. And that is typical of all ancient covenants. There were good consequences for following the covenant terms, bad consequences for breaking them. The Holy Scriptures calls these the blessings and the curses. And we are going to see that Hosea is going to take every divine complaint against Israel and attach it to one of the laws of Moses, or more accurately, to one and then another of the Ten Commandments. Hosea will then proceed to explain God's response to Israel's violation of these various covenant terms by referring to the appropriate curse that each violation brings on. There's still more we need to know to be prepared to study Hosea's word. I think that's enough for today. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning. Products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com Join with us in worship and enjoy God's word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.